Welcome everyone on this beautiful spring evening in New York. Tonight is amazingly our 30th Zoom panel discussion. As we all already take for granted, the magical technology of Zoom programming enables us to connect with an international audience and bring together scholars, collectors from distant locations to join together for what will be about 90 minutes to both educate and inspire us. Tonight's topic on the Art of Zen, entitled Zenga, Filling in the Lines of Zen Painting, will be approached from several perspectives, that of scholar, curator, and collector. Seven panelists in, involved in those exhibitions will discuss how Zen was introduced to the United States, why it gained such traction in the popular imagination, and the pivotal role played by its seemingly simplistic paintings. The creation of this panel and its timing was inspired first by the current exceptional exhibition, None Whatsoever, with Zen painting highlights from the Gitter Yellen collection at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, curated by both Professor Yukio Lippitt of Harvard and museum curator Bradley Bailey. To complement the academic and curatorial perspective, I am delighted to welcome longtime residents of New Orleans and Japanese art supporters on a global stage. Dare I say, the power collecting couple themselves, Alice Yellen and Kurt Gitter. Then secondly, there is currently on view through early June, the noteworthy show titled Lotus Moon and Dandina Staff, the art of Otagaki Rengetsu and Nakahara Nantembo at the Ackland Museum of Art on the campus of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome both Professor Morgan Patelka to offer insights into that show and the brilliant scholar, Paul Berry, who is based in Kyoto uh, to offer his thoughts, but via a pre-recorded video. And thirdly, it's amazing what is available in this country right now. There is an online exhibition hosted by the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies titled True Image, celebrating the legacy of Yin Yu An Long Chi or Inge Noriyuki as we best know him and the art of Obaku curated by a team of scholars who are represented tonight by Patricia Graham, a longtime friend, I mean, so many decades, I'm not counting, who is joining us from Colorado. I must also note there are three other related exhibitions of Japanese painting in, the, in American museums, Ink and Brush and the Beauty and Spirit of Japanese Calligraphy at the Philadelphia Museum of Art that closes really very soon at the end of the month. And if you happen to be able to get there, please be sure to see the gifted Chinese contemporary ink painter and artiste extraordinaire Bing Yi's installation in the Chinese galleries. At the Denver Art Museum, there are works by Otagaki Rengetsu in the Fong uh, Johnston uh, collection on view in an exhibition focused on Japanese female artists. And finally, just opened is the major exhibition with three rotations at the Metropolitan Museum of Art titled Anxiety and Hope in Japanese Art that runs through July 2024. So none of you have an excuse for missing it. Uh, the first rotation will run through August. Uh, what an amazing array of support and interest in this country for the powerful genre of Japanese painting. It's incredible. As an indication of the broad international appeal of the subject, tonight we have over 500 registrants from over a dozen countries, from Vladivostok to Honolulu, Vancouver to Wichita, The Hague to Vienna, and Jerusalem back to Adelaide. Indeed, we even have registrants from 38 states from across this country. Included in this diverse audience are an extremely large group of academicians and museum professionals from around the world. So a big welcome to everyone who has gathered to join us from near and far, all of whom are interested in this captivating aspect of Japanese history and culture. Additionally, and, and poignantly, I wish to announce that I am dedicating this panel to the memory of the brilliant, devoted teacher, scholar, author, poet, and even musician, Stephen Addis, 
without whom perhaps few of us, if any of us, would be here having this discussion tonight. And then on another somber note, we just learned of the passing of the pioneer collector of Edo painting, uh, Joe Price, at age 93, whose collection resides in part at LACMA in Los Angeles and at the Itamitsu Museum in Tokyo. Uh, these men were truly giants in the field of uh, Japanese painting. So let's get started. Uh, and my first question will be for uh, Professor Lippitt, and um, I will introduce each of these uh, renowned figures um, on an individual basis. Yukio Lippitt's research and teaching interests center around Japanese painting of the medieval and modern eras. He is the Jeffrey T. Chambers and the Andrea Okamura Professor of the History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University and former faculty director at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. His book, Painting of the Realm, the Kano House of Painters in 17th Century Japan, was awarded two major prizes. His numerous other books, and numerous is for understatement, Awakenings, Zen Figure Painting in Medieval Japan with Gregory Levine, So Tatsu, Making Waves, and Sesson Shuki, a Zen monk painter in medieval Japan from just last year, which he wrote with Frank Feltons of the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington. His research projects include a collection of essays on Japanese architecture and a book length study on Shosuin Imperial Treasury in Japan, a collection of over 9,000 objects spanning Silk Roots and East Asian cultures. Amazing. So my first question to Kyo is, uh, the most important figure in the None Whatsoever exhibition is Hakuin Eikaku, who is represented by many superb paintings drawn from Kurt and Alice's collection. For our clay focus view, view viewers tonight, and those who are not Edo painting aficionados, could you summarize what made Hakuin such an important figure in Japanese Zen Buddhism? And more specifically, uh, how, what do you feel his impact was as an artist on other artists in Japan? Kyo? Yes, thank you, Joan. Um, as you see on the slide, uh, Hakuin Ekaku is uh, singularly associated with uh, the tradition of Zenga, which is usually understood to be paintings and calligraphies by monk painters from the Edo and modern periods that somehow express uh, their express Zen teachings. And um, Hakuin is independently of painting a giant in the history of Japanese Zen. He's the figure most associated with the revival of Rinzai Zen Buddhism in the Edo period. Um, his writings include texts that are still extensively studied today, and his reform of the Zen uh, monastic training curriculum is uh, still um, really uh, carried out by contemporary, is, is influenced the methods of contemporary monks trained in the Rinzai school. Painting and calligraphy plays an important role in Hakuin, the propagation of Hakuin's teachings. And this is where he uh, really becomes important for our purposes in cultural history. He's estimated to have created over 10,000 paintings and calligraphies throughout his career. Most of them, if you can believe it, from the last around two and a half decades of his life. So he's a late bloomer. Over 5,000 such works uh, survive. The subject matter is wide ranging, it includes um, subjects which are closely associated with Zen, such as Zen patriarchs and eccentrics but also what we would call outreach paintings, which are paintings which are simply meant to form a connection with, um, you might say, audiences, uh, perhaps that he's hoping to uh, proselytize in the future. And these can be works with just Confucian themes. They can be works of popular folk deities. They can have auspicious messages. And so on the surface, they don't uh, bear any relationship to Zen teachings, but they should be understood as outreach paintings and are an important part of his corpus. Now, uh, Hakuin has been talked about a great deal in terms of kind of hagiographical writings, especially by his disciples. But over the past, I would say 15 years or so, we've learned a great deal more about how to understand the circumstances uh, in which Hakuin kind of emerged during the Edo period. So I just wanted to state a few of them here. Uh, one of them is actually related to uh, the work that 
um, Pat is doing on um, Obaku Zen. The arrival of Obaku Zen in the 17th century and its continuing influence in the 18th century was perceived as a threat, and some might even say a crisis, to the established Zen monastic centers of Japan, particularly the Dinzai and Soto sects. And you might say that it engendered a crisis in authenticity, the authenticity of transmission that was claimed by major monastic centers. And Hakuin's home temple was a branch temple of Myoshinji Monastery. And clearly this uh, backdrop of the threat posed by Obaku and its increasing influence in Edo culture was one of the factors for Hakuin's kind of energetic activities in his own time. Uh, but there have been other ways in which we've learned about Hakuin's um, emergence, uh, sudden emergence in, in his period. And one of them relates to print culture. Print was actually one of the major uh, means through which Hakuin's name spread in his period. In fact, uh, many of his writings were printed and he delivered something called Teisho, which are lectures about his lectures. <laughs> now, I can barely get anyone to listen to a lecture of mine, so it's pretty humorous for me to think that Hakuin is actually giving lectures on his own lectures, but that's what he did. And not only that, but print culture played a subtle role in the kind of, um, in the shaping of his visual output. We know because he was a late bloomer that, for example, that he studied painting manuals. He didn't have formal training as a painter, but many of his um, motifs and his inventive designs are actually borrowed from uh, the print manuals coming especially out of Osaka in the 1740s and 50s. We also know that he was influenced by single sheet prints that were circulating in Edo, such as works by Suzuki Harunobu, who usually isn't a name associated with Hakuin in his artistic output. So it's been really interesting thinking about how the artist Hakuin emerges. And one of the most interesting developments in recent years has been an understanding of Hakuin's in relation to the social protest of his own time. In fact, Hakuin was active during an era when there was widespread dissatisfaction with the corruption of daimyo and the elite status groups. And this led to a lot of peasant uprisings, hyakusho uh, ikki. And especially the research of a local historian named Takahashi Satoshi has highlighted Hakuin's role in these uh, uprisings. We, we know, in fact, some of his writings are very critical of daimyo and were actually banned during his own lifetime, such as the, the text known as Raspberries or Hebi Ichigo of 1754. And we also know that he was directly involved in kind of hortatory, you might say, lectures for groups of local um, leaders of social protests, especially in the domain of Ojima. And I'm just showing you a few images here that show the resourcefulness of Takahashi Satoshi's work in kind of um, going through local temple re uh, registers and even kind of um, trying to analyze the calligraphy of plaques in local temples and showing where kind of Hakuin traveled through this area in the 1760s. So we now know Hakuin to be a very complex figure. And one of the interesting things that's a result of this is that rather than think of him in the history of Zen, it's actually probably better to think of Hakuin within the kind of new religious movements of the 18th century, such as Shingaku and so forth, which were movements that constituted a reorganization of Japan's religious landscape to accommodate better the concerns of larger communities of non-elite uh, peoples in the countryside and the small urban centers of Japan. I just wanted to show you this dragon staff. It's a wonderful example from the Gitter Yellen collection of a work that um, he gave uh, It's as a kind of uh, way of acknowledging some of his most important lay, lay persons. They're, they're not exactly acknowledgments of, of Zen enlightenment or spiritual advancement, but really to form a connection and to say that you are a a kind of a member of my, my Dharma community in a kind of informal sense. And this is one of the ways in which painting and calligraphy served as uh, a way, uh, you know, use the brush arts to mediate Hakuin's relationships with his various constituents, constituencies at, at really all levels of, of society. So again, we have a, a slightly different picture and a slight, slightly new way of framing uh, Hakuin that we're, we, we've attempted to express, among other things, in the None Whatsoever exhibition. Thank you, uh, Kyo. I have a, I'm delighted you put this screen, this uh, particular painting on the screen because we had another variant of this exact same painting in our gallery hanging um, just a few weeks ago uh, with our collaboration with Shibunkaku Gallery in Kyoto. 
And that one was dated a few years earlier um, and was likewise a, a tribute type of painting. Um, have, have you seen many of these with the exact same sort of iconography, standard iconography, the dragon staff and all of this? Um, and if so, you have any idea of how many might have been created? Well, uh, I, I personally have seen a few, certainly, but um, there is a 2010 catalog resume by Yoshizawa Katsuhiro mm -hmm. of Hakuin's work that, that um, includes a number of them. And one of the interesting things about them is that, you know, they're all uh, particularized, but usually they, they have a date and the name of the person uh, to whom it mm -hmm. was given. And this figure, Magobe, is the recipient of this staff and it was actually given on the Buddha's uh, uh, birthday eighth day of the fourth month, which was, uh, of course, a special day in the calendrics of people like um, Hakuin Ekaku. So this must have been a notable person. And one of the interesting things going forward is to figure out who some of the exactly some of these recipients must have been. We're finding out that we can actually excavate these local uh, connections that Hakuin was forming as he made, you know, in his peregrinations around the country. Thank you. That's great. Um, I'd like to turn to your colleague on the exhibition at the MFA, to uh, Bradley Bailey, who is the Ting Sung and Wei Feng Cho Curator of Asian Art at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Previously, he was the first Associate Curator of Asian Art at the Ackland Museum at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he organized two special exhibitions of Japanese art and led the reorganization and reinstallation of the Ackland's Galleries of Asian Art. Bradley has written and lectured widely with a specialization in the art of Japan, focusing on the Meiji period and artistic relations between Japan and the West. He has curated exhibitions on Japanese American and contemporary art at the Mead Art Museum and at the Yale University Art Gallery. Bradley earned his BA and PhD in art history from Yale University, where he also completed his MBA with an emphasis on nonprofit management and museums. Smart guy. Uh, so my question to you, Bradley, is um, to a general public that may not know much in depth about Japan, the term Zen and its concept and ideas are nevertheless quite recognizable if not familiar. How and when did Americans become entranced by the overarching concept of Zen? And who were the key figures in bringing uh, Zen to audiences in this country? And lastly, what role did artists and their art play in this exposure and exchange? Bradley? Thank you. Um, well, I, I, as you pointed out, Zen is, is very popular and well-known, or at least a form of Zen is very popular and well known in America. And so the central challenge with something like an exhibition like the one that is currently on, on view and it has been very popular here at Houston is people will be drawn to, to Zen, but they they won't be quite ready for perhaps, you know, they won't be very familiar with all of the wonderful research and background of, of Hakuin who, who opens the show. And so this one of the central questions uh, of this exhibition is sort of what you just asked, which is how do we get from Hakuin from this Rinzai Zen um, of Hakuin and Zen painting in the 18th century, all the way to a work like you see uh, on the right from the museum's permanent collection, a, a Motherwell study made in 1975. But um, by, the, by the middle of the century, you know, I wanted to draw out uh, the connections that were made because a lot of artists, Motherwell included, by the middle of the 20th century had their own understanding of Zen which at first I think appears divergent from this, this brand of this Hakuin Zen, um, what we've been talking about, but there actually are a, a lot of commonalities that we explore in this, in this exhibition around um, a few key figures. And uh, we're able to do this thanks to the strength of Kurt Nowles' collection. A central figure, you asked about popularity, but really the introduction of Zen to, to American audiences occurred in, at the World Parliament of Religions in 1893 by the monk Shaku Soen, uh, who was also a Rinzai monk, the abbot of Engakuji. And you can see here, uh, I, we're fortunate to be able actually to show one of his Dharma portraits, um, a rather rare example in um, Kurt Nowles' collection. 
And this is a crucial moment in, in not only in the exhibition, but also in the history of Zen, um, Zen in the West, because Shaku Soen, as an abbot, uh, a Zen abbot, he does not speak English that well. And so he needs a translator, uh, not only for his speech, but for to get around. And he brings with him a very endeavoring, uh, very well-educated young man named uh, Suzuki, named uh, Te Teitaro Suzuki, who later becomes Daisets Teitaro Suzuki, uh, or DT Suzuki. Uh, he after the World Parliament of Religions takes up uh, a job with a Midwestern publishing house. And over the course of the next 50 to maybe 60 years becomes uh, really the most indefatigable translator and interlocutor of Zen and um, the history of, of Zen um, and Zen in, in relation to Japanese culture to America. And I think it's quite interesting to think of his contributions, I think that really reach their apex when he is made uh, not only with his publishing, but he's made a, a lecturer at Columbia uh, around 1950. And his classes proved to be very, very popular with many, many painters, including Philip Guston, uh, Ad Reinhardt, Motherwell, John Cage, uh, and others. And even with uh, in another rare example from the museum's collection, a recently acquired work um, by Betty Parsons that I wanted to, to include here because most, you know, in the presence of a great female gallerist, I thought I would, I would also show a work by a great uh, female gallerist. Known principally, of course, as, as the champion of many of these mid-century artists, nonetheless, Betty Parsons, after taking some classes with Suzuki, attempted her own Zen landscapes. And so one of the things that I, I, I thought about in my essay in the catalog and really going into this is, why are artists so important in this? And I think we might think about the way that Hakuin reformed Zen for an 18th century artist in many ways Suzuki's interpre interpretation of Zen was was very much shaped uh, for the comprehensibility of his of his audience. And interestingly, the, the two the two uh, groups in America that paid most attention to his writing and, and were most compelled by him, at least initially, were psychoanalysts and painters. And if you go back and look at many of his publications and his lectures, he does use Zenga or Zen painting as illustrations, but more importantly, throughout his lectures and his texts, he talks about the act of ink painting as really the, the apex of, of Zen experience. And he says this is because, uh, and, and, and artists like Ad Reinhardt echoed this and said it was one of the highest forms of human expression, Zen painting, because uh, at least to Suzuki, it was uh, a record of an instant. It can only be, it can never be taken back. Uh, once the ink is on the paper, um, that's all you can do, you know, and there's, and, and so there's a, a lock, a lack of control, an element of chance. And it's very interesting, one of the, the great things about the exhibition and about being able to put works from the MFA and from the Menil alongside works from the, the Gitter Yellen collection is that it promotes, I think, a more, uh, a more holistic or even syncretic understanding of the relationship of Zen to, to art and Zen to the West. And you can really see in our, uh, a painter like Nakahara Nantembo, um, direct lineage to, to Hakuin, and even Suzuki did say, I use the koan, the koan zen uh, is very important, and koan zen is Hakuin zen, so Hakuin even had a presence in his lectures, but artists such as Mark Toby, who did in fact study in Japan and, and used Japanese materials to make this work, took away from, from Zen not so much the many of the, the kind of spiritual qualities emphasized by, by Hakuin, but rather aspects of uh, in, spontaneity and gesture and of course meditation and the koan still remain central but it's very very enlightening i think to to understand that not only artists but the but the paintings themselves and the metaphor uh, for art is is part of this this process of transmission and i also want to add that um in addition to artists um i think a, a, as as um, suzuki shows and as the this exhibition shows that it's also collections and collectors uh, that are really responsible um, for enlightening us and bringing uh, Zenga to the, the forefront. And so this show is, is an, uh, please come to Houston if you haven't seen it, but um, it was, it was a, a, an immense privilege to be able to work with uh, a great collection and indeed the great collectors uh, of Zenga. Um, so I think they, they play a role not only in the exhibition, um, but also in the transmission of Zen to America. Thank you, Bradley. Gosh, I, I wasn't able to get to the opening, but I definitely have to get out there before the show closes. Uh, the juxtapositions are uh, really enticing. Uh, I also want to say to our 
visitor or our participants and to our uh, listeners, there is an amazing recent music building built in Kanazawa that is dedicated to DT Suzuki. And if you're ever traveling to Japan, which seems like everyone is in a rush to travel to Japan these days, uh, it's a, a very, very much worth the detour. It's a very spiritual, uh, very simple, uh, very inspiring edifice that's one of the great spots, I think, in all of Japan. And obviously, um, he's held in it revered as a god, if you will, in Japan as well as in the United States. Uh, I'd like to go to our, our next panelists, which are maybe, I would, dare I say, the stars of the evening, because without their collection, there would be no show in, in Houston today. Um, and, and Kurt and Alice are dear friends, I should say. Uh, Dr. Kurt, Kurt Gitter is an internationally recognized a retinal surgeon and a longtime collector of Japanese and American self-taught art. Born in Vienna, he emigrated to the United States at age one with his parents to escape the Nazi Holocaust. He was raised in Manhattan in a home with deep roots in culture, learning, and a strong Jewish heritage. In 2014, Kurt received the United States Foundation, Japan Foundation Distinguished Service Award, wrecking his lifetime commitment to promoting friendship and understanding between two countries. Alice Yellen Gitter is the, uh, is the Senior Curator of Collections Research Emerita at the New Orleans Museum of Art and a scholar of American self-taught art. And, uh, recognized author. She has received a BA in art history from Brandeis and an MA in art history from Columbia University and an MA, MA in museum education from George Washington University. For 35 years, she was instrumental in developing the New Orleans Museum of Art as an educational and artistic resource and served in multiple capacities there. Kurt and Alice together have served on boards of multiple museums. Additionally, Kurt was on the board of trustees of Johns Hopkins University, and Alice was on the board of the Institute of Museum and Library Ser Services uh, by presidential appointment, and both were on the board of the Jewish Welfare Federation, among others. Together, they head the Gitter Yellen Foundation and Art Study Center, about which you're going to hear quite a bit. So Kurt and Alice, I'm speaking to you conjointly, I guess. Uh, your incredible story as collectors is detailed in the online None Whatsoever catalog, but for those who may not yet know you, please tell us a little bit about what first drew you to Japanese ink painting and to, of course, Zen painting in particular. And could you tell us the story of your collecting journey through many decades? Kurt Nellis? John, thank you. What a privilege to be the only collector with these wonderful scholars, many of whom I know very well. And you, Joan, the, the mastermind of moderators in this country. <laughs> Nobody's in your league, honey. Yeah. Thank you. It's the truth. Thank you. Thank you. This, is, this is a photograph of Alice and I in front of the uh, pagoda in, in uh, Kyoto on our honeymoon in 1986. Uh, we have we have collectively me and Alice and 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 even prior years have had the opportunity to come to Japan at least forty times over these time periods and they have been very important to us. I had interest in art from from growing up in childhood in my home as well as at Hopkins where I took many art history courses and was already fascinated with the concept of learning about art. I had the privilege in 1956 to meet my friend Philip Perlstein, a well-known figurative art, art painter in New York City, who introduced me to the Cedar Bar down in the village and the Artists Club, where I was introduced to people like Klein, Motherwell, Ad Reinhardt, and many other artists. At that time, in those days, nobody had any money. I bought a painting from Philip for $400, payable over four years, he was thrilled and I was thrilled. That was about the maximum we could possibly handle together. And the artists that I mentioned were also poor at that time as well. At any rate, he had a tremendous influence on me and the influence of these artists, particularly the abstract expressionists, influenced my choices and my desire to learn more about Zen painting when I first saw it in Japan in the early 60s. 
Next slide. I was drafted in 1963, right out of my internship. And with three young children, I moved to the little, little village of Saitozaki, a fishing village, 20 miles from, from Fukuoka and about five miles from Akata Air Base where I worked on a regular basis. We became enamored with the, the life in Japan, the culture and the people and we began to look around for art. I was making $9,000 a year as a captain, so it wasn't an, a time for me to be acquiring masterpieces, but I bought a bunch of ceramics, many of which were wrong, and a few small Sengai paintings that were probably right. The most important thing that happened to us in terms of learning about Japanese art came from dealers and scholars. The dealers most prominently were the Yabamoto brothers, Soshiro in Tokyo and his brother in Osaka, and the Mizutani family and the Yanagi family in Kyoto. They were profoundly great teachers to me over those early years and showed me tremendous numbers of paintings and really taught me more than I could possibly get out of books, very which very few were written at that time in English about Zen painting. Takashi Yanagi is shown here, who's, whom we lost a few years ago. And I met Takashi in the late 60s when I was in Japan, and he was the first major dealer that I came across before, before coming to Tokyo and buying significantly from the Yabamoto family. Takashi was a great teacher and a great dealer, and he provided many, many important Nanga paintings and Rimpa paintings to us over the years. We were sad to lose him in most recent years. His elder brother, Shigehiko, shown here, was a very close personal friend of ours. We would drink together, eat together, and have a lot of fun in Kyoto each year when we came. But more importantly, we bought some masterpieces from him over the years as well. And we miss him dearly, dearly, even now. My, my Zenga collection began to grow, and these show some of the highest aspects of what we've achieved during that time, which, as I stated, came to me from the appreciation of abstract expressionism and the early work of people like Klein, Motherwell, and others. I used to go to Japanese dealers and say, what do you have? And they would show me a painting. I would say, who is that? They would say, Sengai. And I would go to the next dealer and I would say, do you have anything by Sengai? As if I knew what I was talking about. And I kept notes and I took photographs and that's how I learned all about Zenga. And in the first 20 years, bought a tremendous number of Zenga. We must have had two to 300 major paintings of Zenga in our collection. Steve Addis was a very constant friend and advisor, although, uh, and we've lost him recently, Steve wrote our first catalog in 1976 called Zenga and Nanga that traveled nationally. In addition to Zenga, in the, in the last 20 years, 30 years, we've, we've expanded our collection into multiple other areas, including the eccentrics like Jakachu, Rosatsu, Shohaku, and Rimpa paintings by Hoitz and Keats and Seka and many others, and some Yukioi paintings such as the one shown by Hokoba, which we love very much. We have also in the last 20 years been very active in the world of ceramics, much of it due to the, due to the friendship with Joan, who's introduced us to so many artists and whom we had the opportunity to acquire so many pieces. This is a recent piece we acquired in Christie's in the last Asia week by Fukami Suaharo uh, that is now being shipped to New Orleans. They, we have, we've also met some of the Japanese artists themselves in Japan. This is a photograph of Kakurazaki Ryuichi, who lives in Okayama and whom we visited on several occasions. He's shown here with his lovely wife. We went out to dinner with him to a ryokan that was serving all the food on his utensils, shown this, this uh, large sushi platter. And I asked Kakurazaki to make me one like that, which he did, and many others which we acquired. I also asked him if I could buy this large ceramic bowl that was sitting out in his yard. He said, no, that was not for sale, that was for fish. But he ended up sending it to me when my other pieces came gratis to just show what kind of a friendship that was and that we've con continued to this day. Our, one other artist we wanted to specifically mention that we're very friendly with is Ogawa Machiko, who lives in Atami. 
close to Mount Fuji and, and uh, we love her work. We often see her either at her home or she comes into Tokyo and spends one or two days with us when we're there. And she has become one of our favorite artists. Among the objects that I wanted to talk about specifically is we've had large and strong connections with academicians in Japan. I think part of that is that I was an academic myself in ophthalmology. I published more than 100 peer review articles and five textbooks. So it was natural for me to know other academics as such as these people here, showing Sasaki Johe with his lovely wife and Alice and I. Sasaki Johe and his wife were married in our home. They visited us many, many times in New York and New Orleans, as did the Three Ks shown with me, Kobayashi, Kono, and Kawai that have been here on multiple occasions and whom we visit on an annual basis when we come to Tokyo. And finally, I want to acknowledge our dear friend Koichi Yanagi, who's shown here with me and Alice whom we miss already terribly and who was a great promoter for Japanese art in the West. I think that's about it, Joan. Yep. Thank you, Kurt. Um, it's sad. I mean, uh, Koichi's passing is, is palpably felt throughout the country, but perhaps nowhere more so than New York during Asia Week. He was a giant, um, at least in New York, far exceeding his father, who coincidentally was the first major dealer I met in Japan in 1976. So it was a few years after you. Thank you for this walk down memory, memory lane. And thank you for including so many of our dear friend uh, and gallery artists in your talk. Nice to see a little clay represented. Much appreciated. Wow. Uh, so next, I would like to um, speak with Morgan. Um, Morgan uh, Patelka is the uh, chair of the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and the Bernard L. Herman Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He also serves as the co-editor of the Journal of Japanese Studies. Morgan's scholarship focuses on the history of late medieval and early modern Japan with particular interest in material culture, environmental history, and urban history. His latest book, Reading Medieval Ruins, Urban Life and Destruction in 16th Century Japan was published just last year. Morgan serves on the American Advisory Committee of the Japan Foundation and the advisory boards of several nonprofit and educational organizations. Over the past year, he and his students work closely with the Ackland Art Museum to prepare for the exhibition Lotus Moon and Nandina Staff, which he will discuss shortly. So Morgan, this spring, American audiences are so fortunate that still another Buddhist ink painting exhibition titled Lotus Moon and Andina Staff just opened at the Ackland Art Museum. This show focuses on two later painters um, of, the of the late 19th century, Otagaki Rengetsu and Nakahara Nantembo, who are fascinating figures in their own right. Could you please give us an overview about these two artists and the Ackland exhibition itself? Morgan? Sure, thank you so much, Joan. And uh, thank you to everyone who spoke before me who's on this call. What a, a wonderful uh, panel, and I'm learning a lot. Um, I was really privileged to get to work with my colleague, Peter Nisbet uh, at the Ackland. Uh, in a very minor capacity uh, as a kind of consultant with my grad students and undergrads in Japanese history on this exhibition. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, we'll see uh, two hanging scrolls. Uh, the one on the left is a uh, poem uh, that was uh, written by Rengetsu, a Buddhist nun, uh, on a, a square uh, piece of paper that has been mounted as a hanging scroll. Uh, and on the right, we see a, um, a, a zenga, really, right? A work of calligraphy with a painting as well by the Zen monk uh, Nantembo, uh, also uh, mounted as a hanging scroll. And um, part of what's so interesting about this exhibition, I think, is that it was conceived by, uh, by, by Steve uh, Addis, who we've heard so much about already. Uh, and by uh, a wonderful artist, scholar, and collector, Ray Cass, 
Uh, and when when Stephen tragically passed away, uh, Peter, uh, my colleague Peter, really um, had to to find a way to put the exhibition together through uh, a, a network of scholars and students who contributed in all kinds of uh, meaningful ways. Um, these are two very different artists. Um, Rengetsu is not uh, as, uh, affiliated with the Zen tradition. Um, she is unusual in many ways. I'll talk about some of those ways today on this call. I think we'll also hear from Paul Berry a bit about Rengetsu and what makes her so special. But in some ways, just the fact that she's a prominent, influential woman artist from the Tokugawa period, uh, that's, that's really quite unusual. Um, and uh, she not only was known for her beautiful calligraphy, and maybe if we move to the next screen, we can look a little bit at that calligraphy, but also the fact that these are her own poems. She was uh, essentially an amateur waka poet who um, was immersed in the classical tradition of poetry going uh, back to the, the earliest period of Japanese writing and uh, was uh, an eclectic creative who lived in Kyoto after she took her vows as a Buddhist nun uh, independently. Uh, she uh, had a very complicated biography. Uh, she was born the illegitimate daughter of a very senior warrior leader, a samurai leader, and a sex worker, and was uh, adopted by uh, an administrator at the very important Pure Land Temple in Kyoto, Chionin, uh, probably arranged by her father, who wanted her to have cultural, social opportunities in a good family that he could not provide because of the circumstances of her birth. Uh, and she then was sent off to another warrior family to be trained and educated uh, as a young woman in the martial arts, in the, the classical uh, tradition, and uh, she put that education to really good use uh, after uh, a marriage that failed uh, and another marriage that ended tragically with the loss of her husband and her daughter. Uh, she took Buddhist vows and found refuge, um, meaning, spirituality, but also creativity in her poetry, uh, in her calligraphy, and in her pottery. Um, so if we look at the next slide, um, you can see this wonderful poem, Walking Along Akashi Bay, this moonlit evening, searching for fitting words to tell of this beauty. Or if you follow along with me on the slide, uh, Koto no ha no tama hiro wa baya, aki no yo no tsuki ni akashi no urazu, urazu tai shite, with the shite there at the end, sort of hanging off on the lower left corner. Um, she has this beautiful flowing hand and she writes with a very thin brush in this dainty ink that barely seems to make a real impression on the paper. Contrast that with the bold, uh, expressive calligraphy and painting of Nakahara Nantembo. And if we drill down into this work on the next slide, uh, we see that this is um, an image of Mount Fuji by the Zen monk, but the inscription on the next slide is actually uh, a poem written by a member of the Japanese military, Count Nogi Mareske, who's best known to us um, for his uh, really kind of surprising uh, joint suicide with his wife to, to honor the death of Emperor Meiji, uh, an act known as Junshi in Japanese, which had really fallen completely out of practice in the modern era. Uh, and Nantembo had a very close relationship with uh, Count Nogi, as well as with other members of the Japanese military. Uh, some have pointed to this as a kind of disturbing uh, connection to the violence of Japan's colonialism, but I would make the point that uh, Zen institutions in Japan were often allied with samurai leaders and with shogunal governments. From the Kamakura period to the Tokugawa period, there were, in many cases, close personal and institutional connections between Zen and samurai rule. So in some ways, Nantembo was in this amazing work um, honoring a very long lasting tradition in Japan. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Rengetsu later on the call. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have everyone on pins and needles because Rengetsu's story is so compelling. Um, and I, when you 
took that cheeky she poem and you blew it up, the elegance of her calligraphy, I would argue is almost unrivaled. It, it stands apart from anyone else. Absolutely. Just, just the hiragana no. I could fall in love with just the no. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would next like to introduce my old buddy, um, Pat Graham. Uh, Patricia Graham is a former professor and museum curator who is now an independent scholar associated with the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies. She is also a certified appraiser of Asian arts. And anyone looking for an appraiser for particularly Japanese art, she's your woman. Her research focuses on Japanese aesthetics and design, collecting Chinese arts in the Edo period Japan, and the transnational visual culture of Obakuzen. Her many, many publications include Tea of the Sages, the Art of Sencha, Faith and Power in Japanese Buddhist Art, and Japanese Design and Illustrated Guide to Art, Architecture, and Aesthetics in Japan in addition to countless essays in museum catalogs, encyclopedias, and academic journals. Her research has been supported by fellowships from the Japan Foundation Center of Global Partnership, the Asian Cultural Council, the Fulbright Program, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among many others. So Pat, my first question to you, is apart from the individuals we've already discussed, there are certain other key figures uh, critical to the understanding of Zen Buddhism in Japan. The online exhibition hosted by the University of Arizona explores one such strain of Zen visual culture. It is titled True Image, celebrating the legacy of Yin Yuan Longchi or Ingen Ryuki and the art of Obaku. As one of the organizers of this exhibition, could you tell us about the subject of this exhibition and the importance of the visual arts in Obaku Zen? Pat? Thank you, Joan, for that lovely introduction. I'm so thrilled to, um, to be part of this panel. Um, we've already heard about Hakuin and his knowledge of Obaku and his appeal to com commoners. In contrast to uh, Hakuin, Obaku initially appealed more to Japanese scholars and artists interested in China and introduced the Chinese um, literati or intellectual tradition to Japan and only later spread to the general population. The founder, Ingen, which is the Japanese pronunciation for his Chinese name, lived from 1592 to 1673, and he was the highest ranking Chinese Zen master to arrive in Japan in centuries, a literati educated Ming loyalist at a turbulent time in China in 1654, he accepted an invitation from the overseas Chinese community in Nagasaki to bring his teachings to Japan where he subsequently founded the Obaku Zen sect whose headquarters is at Mampukuji in Uji near Kyoto. In Japan, Ingen is celebrated for introducing Chinese Buddhist monastic culture of the late Ming dynasty, which was different from that of the Rinzai sect to which Hakuin belonged in that it incorporated Pure Land teachings, transmitting, uh, he also transmitted literati culture to Japan and inspired new directions in Japanese calligraphy, painting, religious sculpture, seal carving, Chinese-inspired music, um, temple cuisine, a tea ceremony for Sencha that I wrote a book about. And he also introduced to Japan the humble green beans. The online exhibition celebrates Ingen's legacy. It joins many other commemorative activities at leading Obaku lineage temples in both China and Japan to honor the 350th anniversary of Ingen's death in 1673. On the exhibition homepage that you see here, one tab takes you to an overall introduction to Obaku art, and it has acknowledgments and the lenders list. And another tab is for a self-tour option that allows for searching for specific artists, subjects, and themes. There are five thematic rooms in this exhibition, each with introductory texts, and some objects have extended label captions. So make sure to click on them. 
Room one, Ingen and Obaku Zen lineage ancestors features monks who came to Japan and others who never did, including Zen's founder, Bodhidharma. Room two, Ingen's disciples and other Chinese lineage monks includes Chinese monks such as Do Sha Gen, who came to Japan and interacted with the Obaku monks. Room three, artists and poets includes both Chinese and Japanese artists such as Jakuchu, who here has painted the beans Ingen famously introduced. Room four, Arhats and Avalokiteshvara focuses on two of the most important sacred personage that Obaku revered. The painting at right is by an imperial princess, nun, by the way. And room five, traces of Huang Po Obaku temples shows images of Obaku temples by Japanese artists and temple building signboards, which is a distinct, distinct feature of Obaku temples. As I hope this short glimpse of the exhibition reveals, Obaku art encompasses both professional artists, both Chinese and Japanese, um, working in Chinese Ming styles, fine Chinese calligraphy and imagery featuring Obaku temples, as well as amateur artists who are the Obaku monks themselves. In Japan, since 1991, there have been many Obaku art exhibitions, oftentimes with significant anniversaries as ours is. Ingen's birth and death anniversaries are very important, as is Mampukuji's founding in 1661. Yet there has not been a dedicated Obaku exhibition in the West since this small pioneering exhibition, Obaku Zen Painting and Calligraphy in 1978, organized by my professor, Stephen Addis. The present exhibition, like Steve's, features a sampling of the many works in public and private collections outside Japan. Because it's online, we hope our exhibition um, will be periodically augmented. So look at it periodically. The project is the inspiration of Professor Jiang Wu, director of the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies. He's the most important scholar of Obaku religion um, today. The project also includes a lecture series by many of the exhibition steering committee members whose list, name list you see here. And the lectures are um, online, posted to the center's YouTube channel. And I talked about Sencha, Betsy, uh, Elizabeth um, Scharf talked about Obaku portraiture. Paul Berry, who we'll hear from soon today, um, talked about Obaku art generally. And John provided a visual tour of Mam Pukuchi after his two months stay in the monks' quarters there. And Harold spoke about authenticating Obaku calligraphy, yeah. and there will be more to come. And this is just a brief overview of this important and too old, often overlooked aspect of Zen art in Japan. So please look at our exhibition. Thank you, Joan, for including me. Oh, it, it, thank you, Pat. Um, that catalog that you, the students, and Steve and K.S. Wong did, back um, when I just finished my graduate work at Columbia it was very seminal for me. And I used to actually sell quite a bit of Obaku calligraphy back in the old, old days. So it, it's, uh, it, it, my copy looks pretty beat up at this point in time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's great that it's having a new life again, thanks to the really creative idea of having a, a virtual exhibition that will mutate and grow and get better and better. But is there any chance a version of this show might be able to be seen in the flesh in the future? Well, um, the Denver Art Museum recently received a gift of a large number of Obaku painting and calligraphies. And the uh, Jiang Wu is in discussion with, uh, and I am as well, with the curators at Denver about doing an exhibition in the future, not too far away, I hope. Thank you, Fingers Joan. crossed. Thank, thank yeah. you, Pat. Okay, um, I want to turn back to Morgan uh, for his second question. 
Um, could you further elaborate on the position of Otagaki Rengetsu in the Buddhist tradition and the significance of her as a female artist at the time, a popular subject these days? Additionally, especially for the ceramic lovers watching this program, would you please tell us about the significance of her relationship to clay and what role did her ceramics play within her oeuvre and her personal philosophy? Morgan? Right. Rengetsu uh, was born, uh, as I mentioned, in complicated circumstances and adopted into a family where the intention was really that she would attract a husband who would raise the profile of the family that um, would occur through adoption. So the husband would uh, be adopted into Rengetsu's newly adopted family, which was a common practice in the Tokugawa period. But when her familial obligations, in a sense, ended with the, the death of her husband and daughter, she took Buddhist vows. And this ended up creating a space for her to be creative as an individual and to engage in practices like calligraphy and like making pottery that I think happened in many Japanese families. Many women took part in those artistic practices, but their activity would have been hidden behind the name of the male head of the family, which effectively is the name of the business. So in a patriarch or pat patriarchal patrilineal society like Tokugawa Japan, women are creative, women are leaders and entrepreneurs, but sometimes that work is invisible to us because the, the naming practices mask their work. So Rengetsu, by taking Buddhist vows, removes herself from the familial unit and we can see her work under her name. Can I see the next slide, please? Her ceramics are really beguiling because not only do they have a um, almost a naive amateurish quality, they were hand pinched um, in, a, in a way that seems to have been self-taught, although it is certainly related to the amateur ceramic traditions in Kyoto that uh, preceded her. Um, but they also include her carved poetry uh, that is a really unusual way of expressing calligraphy. Um, and uh, Professor Melissa McCormick uh, talked in her lecture at the Ackland Symposium, and I believe also at the sympo or the conference at, at, uh, in Denver, about the haptic quality of reading her poetry while holding a piece of ceramics in your hand and turning it to follow the poem. That is a unique way of experiencing the calligraphy and the words of the poem themselves uh, that is unlike any other form. Her ceramics also, I think, have an intense sociality. They're meant to be used by others. Uh, we see that in the previous slides in the sake cup and the tokuri, and here in the teapot. Uh, and indeed, the life of a, a poet nun like Rengetsu was a life of great social interaction, to the point that she became famous for moving house often in the kind of peripheral areas of Kyoto where she lived to escape her many visitors and her many admirers because she was so sought out for her distinctive artwork and I think her wonderful company that she had to try to carve out a little me time. Even her poems and calligraphy, I think we should understand as social objects. Uh, the, the, the form of this work of calligraphy, the tanzaku, which is the poem slip, is really meant to be held in the hand. It can also be bound in an album or collected in a wooden box uh, or even hung off of a tree during cherry blossom season or uh, the autumnal foliage. But I really imagine Rengetsu brushing one of her own poems in this beautiful mellifluous script and then handing it to a friend, uh, a colleague, a peer, or a customer, because this is part of how she supported herself for the many decades that she lived as an independent nun in Kyoto, uh, to the point where she actually had enough money that she could help support other artists and other causes that she believed in. So truly a unique artist uh, and a wonderful example of someone making calligraphy in the Buddhist tradition. Thank you. Quick question. Do we know anything about who taught her calligraphy? Because her, her, her calligraphy is so idiosyncratic. So this is something Paul might address in his video. Oh, okay. Um, she, she, there are clear influences on her and she had a community of practice around her. 
Um, but I also think she was trying to fulfill her familial obligations even after she couldn't do so in a sense as a, as a mother by engaging with the classical past and connecting to the great poets and the great calligraphers of the Heian era. So in a sense, her teacher was the, the, the classical tradition of Japan. Beautifully said, thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna now introduce um, Paul Berry, who is not physically with us, uh, but is with us in spirit and on tape. Uh, Paul Berry is a former professor of Kansai Gaidai University in Osaka, and previously taught at the University of Michigan and the University of Washington in Seattle. He is now an independent scholar of Japanese art history and cinema based in Kyoto. His many publications and articles on Japanese painting include one of my Bibles, Modern Masters of Kyoto, The Transformation of Japanese Painting Traditions, Literati Modern, Bunjinga from the late Edo to the early 20th century, Poetic Imagination in Japanese Art, and most recently, The Art and Life of Fukuda Kodojin, Japanese great poet and landscape artist, that is the massive exhi exhibition catalog, massive, for the uh, exhibition at Minneapolis Institute of Art, opening this weekend where I'm heading myself. Um, after stopping off in Ann Arbor to see the, the last of the Shigaraki exhibition there, which was the subject of our preceding panel. His contributing essay titled, Reinventing Oneself, The Artistic Careers of Otagaki Rengetsu is in the forthcoming volume, we're on pins and needles, on Tomioka Tessai and Otagaki Rengetsu, soon to be published by the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC. I will, I will read my question that was to Paul, and then we'll play the video. Uh, as I wrote to him, we have heard from our many expert panelists about the significance of art in the expression of and development of Zen. As a connoisseur and scholar who is quite familiar with the material held by both institutions and that is currently available for purchase, could you tell us about the proliferation of forgeries today in today's market? What accounts for this quote unquote buyer beware situation and what should collectors look out for when they are considering acquisitions? What is your sage advice when considering an acquisition of a work by this highly sought after artist, such as Rengetsu or even Hakuin? What are the key markers which one should be on the alert for? Hello, my name is Paul Berry. I'm here to give you a few brief comments about uh, important aspects of assessing works by Hakuin and Rengetsu. It should be kept in mind that uh, a real introduction to either of these artists would probably take two hours apiece, so these are very abbreviated. Turning first to Hakuin, uh, his works are complicated uh, by a number of factors. Tremendous output, important new works of new types are discovered every year, even now. Uh, problems in assessing of works uh, should first be addressed by looking at seals. Um, you need to get the exact copies of the right seals, but there are many, many variant versions of the seals, so you have to be careful to have the right uh, uh, images. However, it, seal assessment for Hakuin is very difficult because many of his works are in bad condition. The seals have greatly faded. Sometimes they're damaged or torn, and so uh, uh, there are many complications to the seal study. Still, that should be the first step. Uh, beyond seal uh, comparison, uh, his works have other unusual features. One thing that is not widely recognized, but I demonstrated in the talk in the mid-70s, that Hakuin retouched many of his works. And his very complicated figural compositions, you normally find uh, pentimento and uh, underdrawings uh, showing through. If it's a very complicated figure work without any underdrawings, it may well be a copy, and there's some very high quality copies. In any case, um, 
the main topic today is Ren Getzel, and we'll move on to her because uh, currently, and actually for a long time, Ren Getzel, um, both in exhibitions and in the marketplace, is totally fuddled with uh, forgeries, and I want to uh, address a couple issues with them. One, when we're looking at forgeries of her calligraphy, there are two main categories. One, uh, uh, freely uh, uh, drawn uh, uh, imitations of Rengetsu's work uh, capture some of the calligraphic qualities, but the actual compositions of the characters and the interlinking are often different than her authentic works. A second category is a careful copy. In this case, the uh, actual shapes and connection strokes look appropriate, but when co closely studied, there are features to the brushwork that are missing. Uh, in this slide, we see comparisons of two Tanzaku. The one on the right is a very high quality work from uh, 1871, and the one on the left is uh, a much lower quality work uh, attributed to 18, well, signed as 1870. If you look closely, you can see major differences in the quality of the line and uh, the way the brush moves. Uh, uh, to fully discuss this would take all of our time, so you'll just have to look at it. But uh, uh, the work on the right has an incredible, uh, graceful line that uh, is very subtly but uh, pronouncedly uh, varied uh, during the course of the line. And the overall compositions and linkages are really elegant, while the left is clumsy by comparison. Uh, there are differences in quality and authentic works, but since these were done almost at the same time, the work on the left is uh, very suspect. Uh, sc scholars in Japan have assembled tables of her signatures that give you some idea of uh, dating of uh, works that are otherwise not dated, and you can follow this uh, yourself, uh, but it, it gives you some idea of the dramatic changes that took place over the last uh, course of her career from midlife to the, her death. This is an outstanding example of a uh, Rengetsu uh, lotus-shaped uh, plate that's in the Denver Art Museum, a gift to the Fong and Johnston uh, uh, collectors. Uh, the, if we look at the detail on the upper left of the foot, you can see that the foot is hand-pinched, and if you look at the incised work there, it's not molded, but it's in, in, incised by hand with a vein lines in the back of the plate. If we look in the lower left corner, you can see very subtle modulations to the incising of the calligraphy that does a great job of mimicking many of the features of her actual calligraphy, although doing it with a, a, a needle in a soft clay. This uh, represents the pinnacle of her work of this type. If we compare that, and another important feature of this is the tomobako, uh, which means that Rengetsu signed and, uh, and wrote a poem and has her signature on the inside of the lid. Uh, having a Rengetsu tomobako is uh, one of the best assurances of the high quality work. Uh, there are many uh, attributions by the many priests at Jinkoin where she lived but many of those uh, box act attributions were written for inauthentic pieces. And so while it's nice to have those later inscriptions, they're not uh, uh, decisive in terms of uh, evaluating the work. One other thing is that Rengetsu boxes are always made of assembled pieces of kiri. Uh, she used very cheap sort of scrap wood. I, I, she undoubtedly ordered this to be done. And so authentic box should be uh, made of um, split pieces of wood that have been put together, as we see here. This also on the right has a Rakuto uh, 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 signature, which was when she was living east of the Kamo River in Kyoto during much of her earlier career. We can compare that plate to another lotus leaf plate, this one by her top uh, disciple, uh, assistant, Kuroda Koryo, here on the left, we can see that the bottom has very complicated vein pattern that's been molded. There's a one-sided mold with a sheet of clay pressed into it. 
and uh, we can see very high quality calligraphy on the inside. <clears throat> If we look at the, closely in the detail of the bottom part, we can see uh, Coriel put in his own seal, Coriolzon, that we see there on the left. He had two seals that he often used on his work. And this pebbly uh, uh, surface is also a feature of his work. Another feature of his work is uh, on the uh, obverse side and around the in inner part of the lip, we see the fret design that was impressed with a stamp. Uh, uh, Coriel frequently did that. However, when looking at the calligraphy itself, we see here too that the calligraphy has many subtle modulations to the way it was incised, making it likely that all Corio did the plate, uh, Ringetsu very likely was the one who did the inscription on the center. Uh, Ringetsu mostly did Sencha and Sake wares, but she also did things for Chana Yu. However, uh, the bulk of the tea bowls uh, for sale today as Ringetsu were later productions uh, made uh, to uh, satisfying the growing demand for Chana Yu among the public. Uh, she didn't make many bowls and they're hand pinched and they have a distinctive shape. One thing that she did do a lot of though is uh, uh, these uh, tortoise shaped uh, kogo for holding incense. Uh, and we see a good example here the signature on the base, and she uh, used a tool to sort of angularly cut out the shell. And uh, these usually come with the tomobako, which is very helpful. This is the tomobako, and this has a date and a signature on the right and a poem that she put on the, the, the top. Even these uh, tomobako uh, for a kogo, which are very small, they're only a couple inches across, even these are made of assembled pieces of wood. She did a great number of sake tokuris. This is a, uh, a very high level commissioned work uh, that um, uh, was never used much so that it looks pretty much like it did when it came out of the kiln. If we look carefully, we can see the, the, the base uh, here, which she did various kinds of uh, shapes for uh, uh, tokuri, the sake flask, but this is a uh, one type and it has this uh, recessed uh, uh, base. These tokuri generally are extremely thin. In this case, shining light uh, through, uh, through the base of the piece and looking down through the neck, you can see that uh, parts of the base are so thin as to be translucent, which is what we're seeing in the upper left corner. This requires extraordinary skill and most of the uh, problematic tokuri are much heavier and although thin have nothing of the thinness that we see in her authentic works. This particular piece also has a, a, a tomobako, it's actually a pair of uh, uh, tokuri and we see her inscriptions and her dedication that she was making this according to the taste of the patron. One of the biggest uh, problems of uh, Ringetsu problems works is a confusion with Han Iso, whose works have been attributed to be a contemporary of hers. And, uh, and actually, though, he's a 20th century potter who greatly admired Ringetsu, produced a huge um, uh, quantity of works using her poetry and so forth. Here we see one example of a kashibachi. It's interesting to note on the top of most of his uh, tomobako, uh, he'll use the words teitsukuri, Inequality work would never say handmade because it shows, um, uh, obviously they're handmade, but he always was proud of them being handmade. There are many features that are specific to his work. If we look at the base, you see a foot ring and you see that it overlaps rather than being a simple circle, the ends overlap on the right-hand side. Also, um, the, the, the bottom is cut flat and this uh, hand-pinched uh, ring is applied directly to the base. This, he used Ringetsu um, uh, inscriptions not only on things in her style, but things in his totally own style. He, he, here is a work probably from the 1960s. And underneath the lid of this, where he signs his own name and he, and he puts his seal on this work and has no relation to Ringetsu, he did a, a copy of a Ringetsu poem, including her signature on the inside. Uh, Quickly looking at it, looks very close to Rengetsu. Carefully looking at it, you see it's quite different uh, in, in detail. 
Finally, recently, his own statement done in 1939, early in his career, about why he was doing so many Rengetsu uh, uh, calligraphies have uh, uh, come to light. Uh, I'll have to stop now, but I hope this gives you some idea of some of the many uh, issues involved in uh, assessing works by Rengetsu and Hakuin. Thank you very much. Uh, what a tantalizing bit of film. Um, we learned a little bit. I want to get Paul back at some point if I can actually trap him and catch him for at least uh, an hour for more wisdom on this really highly problematic field. If any of you go online and Google Otagaki Rengetsu, you will find a plethora of material available to you from all points of the globe, um, which I dare say none of it is real. Um, but that was, I think, an invaluable um, start to a further of this field. So I would like to um, head back um, to uh, Yukio and, and talk about the Gitter collection from your point of view, which you know so well. Um, amassed over 60 years, the Gitter collection was patiently and lovingly assembled by such a committed collecting couple. Could you introduce us to a few of the significant artworks from their collection that were particularly compelling for you as a scholar. Please. Yes, thank you. Well, you know, this this was a, a thankless task to to have to limit my choices to just a few. And uh, I I had to choose one Hakuin. And I speak at length in the online uh, catalog about a, a painting called Seven Gods of Good Fortune by Hakuin. But I thought here I would choose a very famous work, a very iconic, I would say, work of Zen, uh, Zenga, Blind Men Crossing a Log Bridge. Um, this really exemplifies the, the, the half of Hakuin's uh, cohort of paintings that we refer to as kind of Zen teaching or Zen message paintings. And, um, you know, I think it's important to consider uh, what I would call the problem of the mind in Zen Buddhism when thinking about this. Um, our understanding of the world of reality and ourselves is, a, is delusional. It's a product of our deluded minds. And our minds in turn are a product of the karma accumulated over previous lives, uh, usually uh, bad karma. And it projects this world and the sense of self, which is always characterized by craving, craving things, always wanting the next things. Life is shifting, our goals are shifting. And one of the one of the the challenges that um, one of the uh, that is posed to us by Zen Buddhism is how to overcome our mind with our mind. Sounds like an impossible task. Well, it's near impossible. There is hope, though, because uh, everybody has within them a piece of the Buddha nature, a kind of a seed of potential for enlightenment within ourselves. It's something that the the original historical Buddha Shakyamuni had too. How how he achieved spiritual awakening originally. And so being finding and being mindful of the Buddha nature is how we overcome our mind or, or kind of clarify or purify our mind, which would be another formulation. So the reality of the world is emptiness. And um, we don't, we're, we're trying to understand that uh, reality by fighting through the illusions of our own mind. Now, many of Hakuin's uh, paintings are actually uh, thematizing this problem of the mind. And one of the best would be the blind man crossing a bridge. It's, it's, it's a very simple work. You can see uh, it just as its subject says, it, its inscription says, in both spiritual training and dealing with the world, keep in mind the example of blind men crossing a log bridge. That's the difficulty of trying to, again, overcome ourselves, our own minds, to find our kind of non-selves. And uh, I would say that a work like this is allegorical and it comes straight out of Hakuin's lectures. You have to imagine Hakuin standing at the proverbial or sitting at the proverbial podium using countless different allegories and parables about the problem of the mind in Zen Buddhism and one's own training. And many of his paintings are direct visual expressions of the many figures of speech that he would use in his lectures. This one is so wonderful for, for, for so many reasons, but I'll just let you absorb the, the kind of visual dynamism of the work, it's two tones of ink. If we could look at the next slide and the, 
the figures. You can see the absorbency of the paper becomes a part of the visual profile of the painting. It's, uh, it's an expression of amateurism, but not the refined amateurism of literati painting. This is more raw and more completely calibrated to the, you might say, the, the message and the teachings of, of Hakui. I also wanted to mention just one more painting because it's so uh, interesting. This is uh, part of a gift from uh, Kurt and Alice to the Houston MFA, and it's of uh, Daruma, but, but it's by Ito Jakju. And it's interesting for our purposes because it reflects, it's an example of a work uh, of the influence of Hakuing on, you might say, Kyoto, uh, the Kyoto School of Painting in the 18th century. We don't usually associate artists like Hakuing, uh, sorry, uh, Jakchu with Zenga. But um, in recent years, it's become apparent that Hakuing uh, left an imprint on um, artists active in Kyoto, such as Ike no Taiga. And uh, more recently, probably also the case with figures like Maruyama Okyo, Soga Shohaku, and certainly Ito Jakchu. They were, in most cases, uh, trained professional painters or semi-professional painters, but they followed the example of, of Hakuin in expressing in a kind of a unique form of, I would say, uh, amateurish uh, painting the Zen teachings in the Hakuin mode. So they're Zenga painters. We can look at the, yes, the inscription here, which is by Tangai, a monk who, who dies in 1764. So we know the kind of uh, the end date for a work like this states uh, in the first line, the word, the mind or kokoro in Japanese. And so this is also about the problem of the mind uh, in Zen Buddhism. And if we could take a, a look at the, uh, at the next slide, which is a detail of the face, you can see how uh, kind of raw and powerful it is. There is a kind of under drawing, you might say it's outlined in light ink, and then Jakju goes to work with various sized brushes to create a very kind of dynamic uh, face scape of a Bodhidharma, which expresses in very typical, I think, Zenga fashion, both a reverence for the patriarch of Zen Buddhism and a kind of um, irreverence towards the Buddha, kind of poking fun at the Buddha. He's, probably searching for his Buddha nature here, his inner Buddha nature, but, but also looks a little bit confused and even uh, downcast. What's really interesting is if you look at the hairline, you can see that there are the traces of tatami mats. And so one has to speculate that Jakju painted this in, as a kind of improvisatory work in front of an audience, a kind of sekiga, and used very large brushes, a kind of probably a hake brush, which is a brush used to kind of, you know, administer water and sizing on paper as a kind of way of um, purposefully undercrafting his painting, a form of descaling, which again is a new form of amateurism that is introduced through the works of Hakuin to a much larger community of painters during the 18th century. One of the reasons why I think this is such an interesting work. Thank you, Kyo. I love the juxtaposition between the charm of the monks on the bridge and the bombacity of um, Jakju's uh, Daruma. And uh, Mareye, I think it's especially appropriate that we turn a little bit of attention to Jakju uh, today, uh, following Joe Price's death, who was no, there was no bigger advocate of that artist than, than Joe. Uh, my penultimate question goes back to the Gitters. And um, I would like to ask Alice, maybe Alice is answering this question, um, we have many experienced and knowledgeable collectors joining us here tonight who are either considering or actively working with museums to find an institutional home for their collections. Could you tell us about your relationship with various museums, such as the New Orleans Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and how you have collaborated to make your collection available to the public? As many of you on this call who know us, <clears throat> Our relationships with museums, curators, scholars, directors, and collectors have always been intricately woven into the fabric of our daily lives. Collaboration is a key word, and we really enjoy relationships. Our journey with art museums began with the New Orleans Museum of Art, NOMA, in the city where we live. Kurt has been on the board of the New Orleans Museum of Art since 1975, having donated his first painting in 1972. 
along with John Bullard, our very special director emeritus, who uh, was there for 35 years and through our gifting, Noma created a substantial Japanese art department with a designated curator and a permanent collection space for Japanese art. You can see that space right here in this exhibition of our 2017 exhibition, Japanese Ceramics, um, New Forms, New Voices, and it's in our current permanent Japanese art space. Initially, Steve Addis served as the adjunct curator, creating numerous notable exhibitions, followed today by Lisa McCord, who has continued on this track since the mid 1990s. Our institutional relationships expanded, well, we always kept our hand in New Orleans, beyond New Orleans, to museums across the United States and internationally. This list reflects the various institutions to whom we have gifted works from our collection throughout the years. Kurt and I share a commitment to art museums as educational facilities. We come from different perspectives, which have served as an advantage. He is a collector, I as a curator and an educator. Making works of art available to the general public and using our collection as a tool to furthering scholarship have been our motivating factors. To date, more than 400 Japanese artworks have been donated to public institutions from the Gitter Yellen collection. We've had some of the closest relationships with those institutions highlighted in yellow. Well, I'll speak of some of them later and I can't mention them all of them now, I'll just say a few words. Um, mostly I'd say they were developed through relationships, confidence in those people, their institutions, their shared values and goals. Kurt was on the board of the Birmingham Museum um, for a long time and their Japanese department impl implemented an exhibition of his, an idea to organize Kamisaka Seka that traveled to, Kyoto, to the Kyoto National Museum. Additionally, their director, Gail Trexel, shared our passion, our mutual passion for self-taught American art. The Freer, where Kurt served on the board for a decade in his earlier years, was always a great joy to him. He always admired their focus on scholarship, which is a large part, as you can see from his own words, of what he values and so how he spends his time. And he became very close to several directors there, the first being um, Phil Stern, who came up actually with our collection name, Manuan, that is now the name of our website. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, is a great museum across the street from our apartment in New York. We visit it frequently. We've always worked, admired it, admired them and it, and we've, we've always worked with them. This slide displays the catalog covers of various Gitter Yellen exhibitions produced between 1976 and 2023. Today, I will focus on Zen exhibitions. Um, our very first exhibition in yellow, thank you, um, was Zenga Nanga in 1976, curated by Kurt's very dear friend, Steve Addis at the New Orleans Museum of Art. It traveled to five museums at a time in which American art museums were not widely featuring Edo period Japanese painting. In light of today's topic, I will highlight one more important show and in light of the time. And um, all of these, all of these, Zen, these in yellow, are our Zen catalogs that were, that were produced through the years. The one that I'd like to focus on now is called, is in the second air row, two in, and it's an ex exhibition called the Zen Zenda, The Return from America, curated by Professor Yamashita um, from Japan. In this exhibition, which went across Japan to three institutions, the curator focused on this Zen painting as painting, rather than purely as religious expression, as it had been to that point traditionally considered by the Japanese. We're told by some of our friends on this call that that exhibition had a great impact on how the Japanese today think and can think of and consider Japanese painting. In our, la in our most recent exhibition on the bottom right says MFA Houston. Um, this reflects the e-catalog that just came out in 2000. 23 February uh, for none whatsoever. It's accessible online and you can still see the exhibition. None whatsoever was conceived by Professor Yukio Lippitt who co-curated co the exhibition with, with Bradley Bailey. 
People often ask us why Houston, as we have no family and no personal connections, except those friends we've made through our museum inter interactions. The Museum Fine Arts Houston director, Gary Tintero, was a very dear friend to a dear friend of ours, Sylvan Barnett, a Zen collector from Boston, whom we all respected tremendously. Our confidence in both Gary and the potential capability of his institution under his leadership resulted in our decision to make a major gift arrangement with the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston in 2019. Some of those works, one just discussed by Professor by Keo, but Professor Lippitt um, can be seen in this exhibition. If you haven't seen this exhibition, the installation is really superb. They've used their grand space in a, in a magnificent way. And the exact color of the lighting of the paint color and the positioning and everything of the lighting really shows the paintings in the best possible way that one can see these works. In March, 2024, none whatsoever will travel to the Japan Society in New York, a museum that has hosted a previous exhibition of ours in 2004. In late 2024, nuns whatsoever will travel to the Israel Museum that you see here on this slide, an institution to which we personally have been long committed. The Israel Museum is one of the 17th largest museums. Um, it has a visitorship of a million, a million people a year. So there are people looking at the art and only, and it's the only art museum in the Mideast, the Middle East to collect, Jap to collect and showcase Japanese painting. Students and scholars have always been a priority for Kurt and myself. In 1997, we formed the Gitter Yellen Art Study Center to house our art collection and our extensive Japanese art library, as well as to provide exhibition space and sometimes bedrooms for visiting scholars from abroad and from throughout the United States. More than 40 international scholars have stayed with us to date and then annually, we invite students and professors from institutions that train Japanese art PhD students. On the right in this slide, you see, slide, you see Pro Professor Lippitt in 2018 talking to his graduate students about one of our works of art in our space. And on the left, you see Professor Andy Watsky and co-curators Carrie Liu and Zoe Kwok speaking with st and studying works from their, with their graduate students from Princeton, Princeton University last February in 2023. Living with a painting, going to sleep to a painting and waking up to the same painting in the same place provides a very lasting impression and impact on how one can view a painting, the layers of looking at it that a museum can't provide to professors and students. So we're very thrilled that we've been able to offer that opportunity to many. And we're told often that it's one of the greatest impacts of visiting us, along with the direct relationship of looking at artworks and seeing and coming close to sometimes touching the materiality of the work, which becomes harder and harder to do in art museums today, and of course, in universities. Locally, we host lectures by, national, by nationally respected scholars, such as those we've mentioned before, for educators, curators, and museum trust, trustees in our own communicate, community to educate them to Japanese art that they might see in our own art museum or wherever their travels take them. Viewing paintings in conjunction with exhibition projects has always been integrated with our work day in our family lives. It's always been tightly woven into it. While our goal has been to help further the field through the process of our sharing paintings and discussing exhibitions with collectors, scholars, and curators, and museum directors who are at the time strategically building their own institutions, we have simultaneously built relationships and friendships that have deeply enriched our own lives. Thank you, Alice. I well remember as a graduate student, my visits to Mary Burke and sitting in that study room and being able to look at paintings uh, and occasionally ceramics firsthand and how impactful that was that led me on the path to actually working with art firsthand all the time. And I know there's so many uh, future art historians 
and future curators and maybe even a future dealer who visits to the, the Gitter Yellen home was informed by the, those amazing opportunities, um, which is maybe an equal legacy to your generosity and all the museums with, with whom you've entrusted your precious collection. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Joan. I wanted to point out that I didn't say here is that what you're actually looking at is, is the uh, study center itself. Yeah. It's our home for those of you who've been there knows across the way. Yeah, you, there are no more gracious hosts than you and Kurt, for sure. Uh, we have one last question um, to tie this all together, and that's to Bradley Bailey, um, who has the, the, the current show up in his museum. So Bradley, as a curator, it is such a special gift to work with passionate collectors like Kurt and Alice, and to enable your museum and community to benefit from their extraordinary lifetime of collecting. As a curator of Asian art, what advice can you offer regarding creating and cementing a relationship with special collectors in order to expand and enrich your museum's holdings? Well, thank you. Well, if, if anyone uh, has not picked up the, the recent uh, winter edition of Arts of Asia, you can see here on the cover a pair of Yamamoto Baitsu screens that Kurt and Alice gave uh, to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as part of a, a historic gift agreement um, that saw us receive uh, nearly 80 works of Japanese painting. And I, and I should say works, it's many more than, than 80 because something like this Baitsu, which is two extraordinary screens that, that uh, really um, dominated our Japanese galleries uh, on, a, on a previous rotation, um, are considered just one work. So they were incredibly, incredibly generous. But I think, um, and if you read uh, the, the cover article, which goes through the gift, it actually echoes a lot of what Alice just said about working with museums to strategically expand um, the possibilities of what we can do. And I think the, the first and foremost, the, the most important thing when working with any, any collectors, not just Asian art collectors, but any collectors who are thinking of making a gift uh, or contribution to your museum is to understand what they would like their legacy to be. And um, with Kurt and Alice, it was quite it was quite easy because they are both very uh, seasoned professionals when it comes to dealing with, or in Alice's case, working actually, uh, you know, in a museum. And so, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, one of the things that they understood very very well was that our holdings in certain areas, especially in international modernism and contemporary art, were extraordinarily strong. Um, so even with mid-century abstraction, um, as you can see here from this installation shop, um, which features a, a pseudo kokota from the the Gitter Yellen collection, alongside artists like Clifford Still, Motherwell, uh, Toby, and Zheng Chong Bing, as well as this extraordinary, I should say, this extraordinary Kondo Takahiro um, in the in the center of the room. But they understood um, not only what our needs were, but I think also what the possibilities that other areas of our collection and even our peer institutions, I should say, that 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 Clifford Still was is very generously been lent by the Menil um, from a few blocks away. Um, so they working with them was also an iterative process and coming to understand um, what we could actually do with with their collection and what what they would want their legacy at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to be. And the main thing, yes, thank you for this next slide, is understanding how their collection would fit in with ours. But I should also say um, that in amongst these seventy eight works, they were very very carefully chosen by uh, by Kurt and Alice so that we didn't receive anything that wouldn't allow us to tell a story. Uh, it wasn't simply Zen paintings. It's, it's paintings from all schools of uh, nearly every school of Japanese art. And uh, it, it is, they did not give us, uh, they gave us singular masterpieces, but they did not give us loan works. Uh, they gave us pieces that could be in dialogue either with objects from our collection or uh, other areas of, of the gift. And I want to say that it's been, um, if a gift like this, we, we've been referring to it in all of our press releases and everything as a transformative acquisition. And I, I should say it, it has not only transformed the trajectory and the potential of the Asian art department here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, but it's really transformed how we look at some of our collection or the Menil's collection um, and even Zen painting. And and the privilege of being able to show works from Kurt and Alice's collection alongside some of our uh, stronger, uh, strong modern works has really, you know, Yukio actually and I were talking about when at the opening how 
this uh, Inoue Yuichi calligraphy that you see here on the right actually is Zen painting, um, but on the level of it's Zen painting engaging with international conceptual art and the, the concepts of seriality and um, kind of meaninglessness of numbers and a lot of the things that an artist like John Cage, whose Rio Anji drawing you can't really see in this in this photo, but it's that left um, is also engaging with. And if you go to the final slide, I just want to, to say this is one of the, in terms of new, new, um, new perspectives on our collection, um, you know, the exhibition, as you've seen, it opens with an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary selection of over 30 paintings by Hakuin, which I think is more Hakuin works than anyone can see anywhere. Um, but in putting together this final section of, of the exhibition, their their collection and their gift allowed me to, to see objects from our collection in a new light. For example, these these Ada Reinhardt screen prints that the museum acquired in 1986, and they have never been shown until uh, until this exhibition. And I and of course we can talk about them in the context of you know uh, anti-capitalist gestures, kind of an anti-Warhol gesture. But they've been very very popular as one of the final works in the show because one is one is forced to be directly present in front of them, staring at a wall, not unlike this incredible wall gazing dharma from the Gitter Yellen collection. So I think that the main things are understand, you know, working with collectors and you're, if you're very fortunate enough as I have been to work with collectors who understand museums and understand your collection, um, it, it, it allows, you know, almost limitless possibility with, with things you can do with, with a major transformative gift, um, gift such as this. And I should also say, you know, really um, treating that legacy, uh, respectfully. And uh, at our museum, at least, we have a, a labeling system such that all of the works given by Kurt and Alice, even works that were given years before um, this transformative acquisition, will forever be, um, will forever bear the, the label of the Gitter Yellen collection. So it is the Gitter Yellen collection at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. And I think it's been a wonderful, um, a wonderful project working, working with them over the course of uh, several years now to to build this collection and, and now to have this extraordinary exhibition where we get to show off so much of it. But not all of it, we still have a lot more uh, left to show. So please, please keep coming back. Thank you, Bradley. I mean, we all have to get ourselves to Houston and then to see the new venue when it travels more conveniently for us here to Japan Society, I'm sure it will be a completely different show. Hopefully some of the Western art will be able to travel. Is that possible? Or we're, they yeah. we're working on it. Yeah, I mean, the, with with Houston, uh, we obviously have uh, an incredible amount of space in in these galleries that most of which have twenty two foot foot ceilings, and uh, I think yeah. it's you know almost ten thousand square feet of space. So it will be uh, the show will be kind of refined and distilled for for Japan Society. But I think that these works, especially the Zen works, are are so strong um, that. Um, I'm sure that it will be a beautiful, um, beautiful iteration of the show. Wonderful. So we're running a little bit long. Um, I just wanted, there was one question that came in that given we've uh, spoken so much about um, uh, collection building and about collections past and present, I think it's worth offering up um, a question that came from an individual. And it relates to even what Kurt, what Kurt was talking about with his first acquisition by Pearlstein, which took four years to pay off. Where does one begin collecting? How do you collect without vast sums of money? Where does one begin? Does anyone want to take that question? Maybe the collectors themselves? In my case, I was interested in, I was already before I bought Philip's painting, I was already going to some museum exhibitions. I said that I'd taken a whole bunch of art history courses at Hopkins, even though I was pre-med. And uh, it, it fascinated me. And when I met Philip and he brought me down to the Cedar Bar and to the Artists Club, and I met all these artists, all of whom were poor like I was at the same time, uh, it, was, it was really a, a, a wide awakening of uh, my exposures, which which were very very gratifying, and that's what prompted my early collecting of Sangha for the first twenty years in Japan more than any other subject. It was only in later years that we got into all of the other aspects of Japanese art that I did or I just described. I don't know if I answered that properly or not. Well, I would argue that. Zengo, when you started collecting in the when you were stationed in Fukuoka and started to buy this material, 
was a neglected area in Japan. And it was a real, and the, first of all, the dollar was ridiculously strong, but you had a great opportunity to collect in an area that was pretty much overlooked uh, in Japan. And I would, as a dealer, recommend to people, if you can find an area that inspires you and that you do your homework with that is out of fashion. And a, a great part of Japanese painting is out of fashion at the moment, to say the least, particularly bunjinga, uh, literati painting. Um, it's a very good time to start with a minimal investment with something you love from someone you trust and who does the homework for you to get started. Anyone else? I was just gonna say Japanese art. If you have limited resources, all of Japanese art is so undervalued uh, on the market today. So yeah. it's, this is the best place to start. Yeah. Thank you, Bradley. So thank you speakers uh, far and wide and Paul off um, in a distant, we've, we've loved hearing from all of you. This video will be available probably towards the middle of next week if you wanna revisit this conversation or if you want to recommend it to others. I just wanted to put up uh, a slide for you about the uh, uh, accessibility of materials that were spoken about tonight um, that are available uh, from your local online bookstore or online um, period. Um, please take a look. And just a small pitch for what we've been doing, um, our catalog for Asia Week is still available for anyone who's interested in the clay side of the story and a very different approach to ceramics than Otagaki Rengetsu. And our next show opening on the second is uh, juxtaposing a um, pretty much unknown major figure uh, in my mind, uh, Kashiro Toro, and thank you, Bradley, for acquiring one of the great pieces by him for your inaugural exhibition in your new building uh, quite a, a number of years ago, and Hattori Makiko, who's already known to many of our viewers and has a, a big following on a global stage. So thank you all. Good night, and stay tuned for our next uh, Zoom talk, and you'll be getting information by that for about that as uh, we get it codified for you. Take care, enjoy spring wherever you are. Good night. <laughs>